okay welcome to robotics 1 today's lesson is very important so i just need to write it down important lesson because your next quiz will utilize the material from today's lesson so let's quickly recap what we have been doing so far we are trying to study the dynamics of robots now the way we started we started with a simple pendulum now this simple pendulum has mass m and length l so this rod this rod was assumed to be massless and the entire mass was concentrated at the end so for that when we looked at the mass moment of inertia we looked at mass moment of inertia the equation that i gave you was mass multiplied by radius of gyration square gyration means revolving or moving so if you look at the radius of gyration for this particular problem it is l so the value of i is going to be m l square but this is a very simple approximation in actual practice you will never have a a rod that is massless so this is called as simple pendulum simple pendulum and the actual pendulum is something like you have a mass that is distributed across so you have a pendulum and the mass is distributed so mass is distributed so the total mass is m but this total mass is made up with this teeny tiny particles that are dispersed in this mass now we studied the concept of centroid and center of gravity so what we can say is this mass it's concentrated at this location cg so the total mass so total mass mass is equal to m and we assume that total mass to be concentrated at cg and what i'm going to do is i'm going to say the distance from cg you perform the calculation for cg you use the concepts that you studied in statics and dynamics and you found out the cg is at radius r and now if we want to formulate the differential equation of motion when the mass is distributed so please understand in this particular case the mass is distributed it's not concentrated at the end so i'm going to use the langrangian approach and what we do in the langrangian approach is first we want to find out the kinetic energy and then we have to find out the potential energy now what i want to give you here is a generalized expression for kinetic energy the expression for kinetic energy is mass multiplied by velocity at the cg square multiplied by 1/2 so 1/2 mass multiplied by velocity of c velocity at cg plus 1/2 
I, which is mass moment of inertia at CG multiplied by angular velocity square. So I need to write these down. So V is the velocity at CG. And omega is the angular velocity. Velocity. Now, please note, angular velocity basically is nothing but this. I'm going to call this omega. Angular velocity, whether you consider it at CG or you consider at any other location, it's going to be the same. So this is very important. Omega at CG is equal to omega at any other location. So omega at CG is equal to omega at any other location. So value of omega does not change. But the linear velocity, and this is very important, this is linear velocity changes depending upon where you take it. So what we want to do is we want to find out the velocity at CG and we have to find out mass moment of inertia at CG. And this is super important. This is mass moment of inertia at CG. Now, this mass does not matter. This is the total mass. And this important expression will be used whenever we try to derive the dynamical equations of motion or equation of dynamics for robot arms. Then we have something called as the potential energy, which is V, which is potential energy. And whenever we find out the potential energy, we are going to find out the potential energy with respect to the, the center of gravity. So for an example, in this case, potential energy is going to be R cosine of theta, assuming this angle is theta. If this angle is theta, r cosine theta times m times g. It's not going to be the total length. And I need to specify that. Say the total length of this irregular object may be L. But this L does not come in the picture whenever we try to derive the kinetic energy or the potential energy. This is super important. Now, why is this important? Because when we are trying to study the, the actual robot, the robots are going to have some complicated shapes, very complex shapes. So how do you find out the mass moment of inertias for these complicated shapes? And in that case, SolidWorks or CAD softwares come to rescue. So whenever you import that geometry inside the CAD software, you can right click and it will give you something called as the principal moments of inertia. And those are the moment of moments of inertia that we will use. And we will look at that when we study an actual problem. But let's try to solve a few simple problems with this concept. So what I'm gonna do is, first and foremost, I'm gonna give you an expression for the mass moment of inertia for a rectangular rod. So consider a rectangular rod. And for this particular problem, I'm going to assume a three-dimensional shape. I'm going to assume a three-dimensional shape and then we will try to simplify our assumptions in subsequent problems. So I'm going to call this length as L. And I'm going to call this length, I mean this dimension, 
as height h and i'm going to call this dimension as width first and foremost let's identify the cg so cg will be somewhere at the center so cg is going to be somewhere over here let's identify the axis so the rod the rectangular rod is going to have axis like this so you have uh, an x axis you have a y axis and you have a z axis and now what it means that this rectangular rod if assuming the mass of the rod is m m is the mass of the rod and this is the total mass which is distributed everywhere so if you were to add all the masses the particles then the total mass is m and we have found out the cg and this cg is going to be half of length half of width and half of height so if you really want to look at where this cg is located if you look at the side view the cg would be at this location and that means this distance is going to be w by 2 if you look at this distance this distance is going to be h by 2 and if you look at the the top view if you look at the top view and the cg would be at the location l by 2 so this is where the cg is going to be so this is center of gravity this is center of gravity now i want you to assume the rotations about z so assume that you this rod could rotate around z this rod could potentially rotate about y and this rod could potentially rotate about x so let's try to understand the the concept of kinetic energy i am going to say omega z is the rotation about z so imagine for some reason you have a hinge and this rod starts rotating about z you have omega x which is the rotation about x and you have omega y which is the rotation about y and what i want to do is i want to find out first total rotational kinetic energy so what i'm going to do is i want to find out total rotational kinetic energy and the expression for total rotational kinetic energy is very simple which is i'm going to write this down one half i z z mass moment of inertia about z z multiplied by omega z square plus one half i x x multiplied by angular velocity square about x plus 1 half i y y omega y square now the question is what is i x x what is i y y and what is i z z and i'm going to give you expressions so please pay attention and there is a symmetry that you can follow look at i z z what are the two important dimensions here you have this dimension and this dimension so i z z is perpendicular to the plane x y 
so basically the z axis is perpendicular to the plane that comprises of x and y so the equation is 1 by 12 m now the these two dimensions are one is l square plus h square so i z z this dimension is perpendicular to the plane x y so l is the dimension around about x and h is the dimension about y now let's look at i x x so for i x x the the it's the two dimensions that are interested in the perpendicular dimensions are h and w so i x x is 1 by 12 m you have uh, h square plus w square and last but not least i want to show you the dimension around y so the dimension around y which is i y y you have l and you have w so 1 by 12 m l square plus w square that is how you would find out the moment of inertia as about the cg of a rectangular rod and rectangular rod is the simplest approximation for the robot arm rectangular rod is the simplest approximation for the rectangular rod and just for the the completion let me just write this down so these are the dimensions now let's take a very simple approximation of the the rod it is called as the slender rod so so one level approximation is called as the slender rod so in slender rod the most important dimension is the length of the rod so the most important dimension is the length of the rod and we assume the other two dimensions which is width and height they are approximately zero so so if you have a slender rod and let's try to draw this slender rod in three dimensions just for completion purposes and now let me identify the coordinate system so this is the coordinate system this is x this is y and this is z so if you want to find out i x x i y y and i z z you will use the exact same expressions that we derived for the rectangular rod except you will substitute w is equal to 0 and h is equal to 0 in that expression so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write these expressions down i y y is 1 by 12 m l square i x x is equal to 0 because w and h both of them are 0 and i z z is equal to 1 by 12 m l square so this is what we mean by a slender rod however the practical robots they are going to be not as simple as the rectangular rod or a slender rod for an example you could have a practical robot that link shape is maybe super complex so something like this you have a practical robot where the shape of the robot is something like this and then there is a hole here there is a slot here 
and then there is another hole here there is another hole here so what would you do in that case in that case we will actually do a cad model so you will actually do a cad model and once this geometry is inside the cad model the centroid will be calculated numerically by the cad model and then you can right click and you ask for principal principal moment of inertia and this principal moment of inertia would be written in a slightly interesting fashion it will be a 3 by 3 matrix and then it will be i x x i y y i z z and there will be zeros on the off diagonal terms so when you import a complex geometry inside the cad model and you ask the cad model to compute principal moment of inertia it will give you a matrix this is called as inertia tensor and depending upon at what location this is calculated the values would be different but you should always find out at cg that is absolutely important at least uh, for the robotics one where we are studying the langrangian langrangian equations so when you are trying to study uh, dynamics of a practical robot you construct the geometry inside the cad software and then click and then what it will do is it will numerically calculate these principal moments of inertia now what i'm going to do is i'm going to look at a very simple dynamics problem with a slender rod now we looked at the simple pendulum as our starting example now let's look at something called as a, a compound pendulum or let's consider a slender rod so now what i have is instead of a pendulum where i had mass at one end and the the rod was massless now i have this distributed mass m distributed mass m and i'm going to give the length of this rod as l and let's try to derive the equations of motion so first and foremost where would be the centroid in the case of a slender rod the centroid is obviously going to be at this distance which is l by 2 this distance is l by 2 and let's try to write the expression for kinetic energy kinetic energy for this rod is mass one half mass linear velocity at cg square plus one half i at cg multiplied by omega square now if you were to look at the the axes you will realize i can set up the axes like this this is my x axis is my y axis and z axis is coming out so to be very precise this is actually my i z z so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go and write this expression down which is 1 half m velocity is always omega times r where omega is the angular velocity and r is the radius so the radius in this case is l by 2 and omega is nothing but theta dot so theta dot is the angular velocity 
let me give you value of theta this is theta so theta dot is the angular velocity and l by 2 is nothing but the radius so this velocity is going to be something like okay, if i were to show velocity in the same direction so this is going to be v which is l by 2 theta dot now the angular velocity so it's going to be theta dot times l by 2 square plus one half for the slender rod the mass moment of inertia about zz is m l square by 12 so m l square by 12 and omega is theta dot square so when i write this equation down when i write this equation down this equation becomes one half m l square by 2 square theta dot square plus one half m l square by 12 theta dot square so this expression can now be written as one half m l square by 2 square is 4 plus m l square by 12 theta dot square so this expression can now be written as one half m l square by 3 theta dot square so that is what the equation simplifies to so when you combine the terms now let's write the equation for the potential energy potential energy here we will have to be very specific potential energy is always with respect to cg where the mass is located even though the length of this slender rod is l mass is located at distance l by 2 and considering this as datum this as datum the vertical distance this vertical distance is l by 2 cosine of theta so this distance is l by 2 cosine of theta and since it's going below datum the potential energy is minus m times g l by 2 cosine of theta and please recognize that there is a negative sign because the cg is below datum we are going down now we have to formulate the langrangian so let's start i'm going to formulate the langrangian l is equal to t minus v and t is one half m l square by 3 theta dot square minus v let's not forget there is another minus sign mg l by 2 cosine of theta now we got the langrangian now what we need to do is we will solve this langrangian using the langrangian equation let me just write this langrangian m l square by 3 theta dot square plus m g l by 2 cosine theta and the expression for langrangian is d by dt partial l by partial theta dot minus partial l by partial theta so let's go step by step d by dt partial l by partial theta dot which means all other terms except theta dot is constant so this is going to be one half 
m l square by 3 multiplied by 2 theta dot plus 0 minus here it's partial l by partial theta which means theta dot is going to be 0 so first term is going to be 0 plus mg l by 2 derivative of cosine theta is minus sine theta so this is going to be minus mg l by 2 sine of theta so when i solve this i need to take the derivative and this is the full derivative this is not the partial derivative so when i do the full derivative one half one half gets cancelled and i get m l square theta double dot because it's a full derivative plus m g l by 2 sine theta is equal to 0 and this is the differential equation of motion of the slender rod this is the equation of motion for slender rod and this equation can be solved numerically and we will be able to get the, the solution of the differential equation any questions up to this point Now, if you want to use MATLAB to do the whole calculation, please note the only input that MATLAB would need at this point is this. So this would be the input to MATLAB and MATLAB would derive the equations. Now, let's try to understand this problem in a slightly different context. Now, if you look at the way the problem was set up, this is a planar problem. So this is planar, which means this slender rod was only oscillating around Z. So planar means no motion, no motion about X, or y however if you look at practical robots problem the robot problems are actually three dimension so which means you would have a slender rod or a link that will have motion in three dimension so how do we solve a problem when the motion is in three dimension so let me set up the problem so consider a rod and now this rod is capable of moving or rotating in x, y and z direction. So this is x, this is y and this is z. And for the most general case, let me say I have Ixx, which is the mass moment of inertia about x axis. I have y, y, which is the mass moment of inertia about y axis. And I have I, z, z. And these are given to us or computed, computed by a CAD software or they are for the sake of discussion they are known and the units are kilogram meter square so ixx iyy and izz is given to us now let's assume for the sake of discussion that there is a spherical joint here so what i have here is a spherical joint so this 
is a spherical joint. So spherical joint or a ball or socket joint, what it means is this guy, this link can move around X, around Y, around Z. So you could have a translation about Z, you could have translation about X, you could have translation about Y. Now, some of you may ask me, uh, well, would what does it mean when you have translation about X, translation about Y and translation about Z? What it means, what I'm trying to say here is, it could have VZ, it could have VX and it could have VY. I mean, this, it may not be physically realizable in this particular configuration, but I want you to understand that because of the nature of the spherical joint, you could have a component of velocity, component of linear velocity about Z, a component of linear velocity about X, and you could have component of linear velocity about Y. Now, if I were to ask you, find out the kinetic energy, the expression for kinetic energy is kinetic energy in translation plus kinetic energy in rotation. Now, how do we find out the kinetic energy in translation? Again, first find out what is the total mass and we assume this total mass M is located at CG. Kinetic energy in translation is nothing but one half M VX square plus one half M VY square plus one half M VZ square where VX is the component of velocity above in X direction, component of velocity in Y direction is VY, component of velocity in Z direction is VZ. So this is the kinetic energy in translation. Plus the kinetic energy in rotation is one half IXX omega X square plus one half IYY omega Y square plus one half IZZ omega Z square. So now you have the expression that is needed for kinetic energy. And please note, this is a three dimensional equation. So you are gonna have a uh, Vx, Vy, Vz, they represent the translational motion about x, y, and z. And you have omega x, omega y, and omega z. That is nothing but the rotational motion about x, y, and z. Now let's try to find out the potential energy. Now in this particular case, how do you find out the potential energy? One thing I want you to understand, potential energy is always about gravity. So find out in which direction the gravity is. So for an example, this is the direction in which the gravity is acting. If this is the direction in which gravity is asking, what you need to do is, you need to find out the component which is uh, about gravity. So this length, and I'm gonna show it over here. This is the length. And depending upon how this rod is oriented in three dimension, this length would be changing. So for an example, if uh, the rod has uh, two angles, theta and psi, then you will have to take appropriate components. And I'm gonna call this as 
let me show it with like L. This is L. And the potential energy is minus M G L. So whenever you find out the potential energy, you will have to take the component around about in the gravitational uh, direction. Now, uh, I will answer the questions uh, about the homework at the end. Let me finish the discussion on what um, we are supposed to cover today. Now, how do you find out the kinetic energy and potential energy when you have a robotics problem? The good news is, believe it or not, the problem is actually solved. Whenever we are working out the forward kinematics, the problem is actually solved for us. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to set up the problem. I will try to uh, find out the kinetic energy and potential energy for one or two problems. And in next class, we will see how we can solve the prob this problem uh, using MATLAB. And the next uh, uh, slightly different iteration there is, what would we do in the case of practical robots if the shapes of the links are not like circular or rod, they are some non-standard shapes. How do we address that issue? And that will come in future classes. But let me work out a problem that we are familiar with. Now this problem, it's similar to your homework problem, which I worked out in last class. And this is problem we solved in lecture 12. And we actually used MATLAB to work out and find the dynamical equations of motion. And then we analyzed using MATLAB. In this problem, what we have is we have a revolute joint. Then there is a link. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this link, unlike the previous problem, I'm going to make this link a solid link. So what we have is we have a solid link and then we have a revolute joint. On this solid link, what I have is I have another revolute joint. I have another revolute joint. And this another revolute joint is attached to another solid link. So what I have is I have another solid link. And just to make it make it proportionate, let me, let me draw uh, the, the revolute joint like this. So I have link one and I have link two. In this case, the difference being these links are not massless, but the mass is distributed. So this link has mass M1, which is distributed. And this link has mass M2 that is again distributed. Now, how is this problem different than the problem that we solved in last class? In last class, we had a revolute joint, but the total mass for the link one was concentrated at the end. Then we had another revolute joint. We had another revolute joint. And the mass for link two was concentrated at the end. So you had M1 and you had M2. Unlike that problem, now the mass is distributed. 
Okay. Now we have the first revolute joint, which is R. We have a second revolute joint, and this is the end effector. This is the coordinate of the end effector. This is where the end effector is. Now, the way we would solve this problem, it first and foremost, we will set up the coordinate system. And we know how the coordinate system is gonna look like. So I will quickly draw the coordinate system, X naught, Y naught, C naught. And then you have another coordinate system. You have Y1, Z1, and X1. And you have one more coordinate system at the end, which is X2, Z2, Y2. X2, Y2, Z2. I'm not going to derive the equation for forward kinematics, but we will refer to the equations that we derived in lecture 12, and I will refer the notes. So if you just want to uh, uh, refresh yourself, you can go to Canvas and quickly download the notes for lecture 12. Now, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna find out the centroid of link one. The centroid of link one is over here. So this is where mass M1 is concentrated. Centroid of link two is somewhere over here. This is where mass M2 is concentrated. Now my first and foremost objective is to find out the equations for kinetic energy. And when you have a distributed mass and when you have a robot which has uh, something, the links, something like this, it's not a trivial task. And we have to proceed very systematically. And the reason I say we have to proceed very systematically is because you will be having velocities in three different dimensions, X, Y, and Z, and you will have uh, angular velocities in three different dimensions, and you have to find out the kinetic energy for link one. So I need to write this down. We have to find out kinetic energy for link one. Then we have to find out kinetic energy for link two. Then we have to find out kinetic energy for link two. This will be the total kinetic energy. But please understand when we find the kinetic energy for link one, you are gonna have kinetic energy of translation. You will have kinetic energy of rotation. Kinetic energy for link two will be kinetic energy of translation. Then you will have kinetic energy of rotation. Then you will have to find out the potential energy. When you find the potential energy, same thing, you will have to find out the potential energy for link one. And then you will have to find out the potential energy for link two. The good news is we already have the information that we need. So what are we going to look from the, the forward kinematics? Look at the solution for the forward kinematics. Forward kinematics. And let's try to see what information we need. For 
kinetic energy in translation let's look at link 1 i'm going to look at link 1 now i'm going to look at link 1 and i'm going to look at kinetic energy in translation to find kinetic energy in translation i need the velocity of mass m1 how do we find out the velocity of mass m1 what i need to do is i want you to look at your homogeneous transformation matrix 0 h1 i want you to look at the homogeneous transformation matrix 0 h1 in this homogeneous transformation matrix h01 you are going to have a 3 by 3 matrix here that represents the rotation 0 r1 you are going to have 0 0 0 you are going to have 1 over here and you would have px py pz now px py pz is the distance between frame 1 and frame 0 i want you to look at expression for px py and pz you would realize the expression and at this point what i'm asking you to do is i'm trying to i want you to look at 0h1 from lecture 12 you will notice your px is 0 py is 0 and pz is equal to a1 are you with me so far if you look at your 0h1 you going to have px is equal to 0 py is equal to 0 and pz is equal to a1 what that means is this is a1 now what i want you to do is with this information i want you to tell me the coordinates i want you to tell me the location of mass m1 and location of mass m1 and i'm going to write this down here location of m1 is 0 about x0 0 about y0 and a1 by 2 about z0 are you with me so far so this mass m1 is located at 0 0 a1 by 2 from uh, the the reference frame which is the inertial frame which is zeroth frame which is over here any questions here so i am interested in finding out i know the location i am interested in finding out the velocity vx so for mass i want to find out vx of m1 vy of m1 and vz of m1 i am interested in finding out the velocity in x direction velocity in y direction velocity in z direction for mass m1 so what i do is i take this expressions for location and in this particular problem the good news is uh, the position of mass m1 about x0 is 0 position of mass m1 about y0 is 0 position of mass m1 about z0 is again a1 by 2 but please understand a1 by 2 is a constant so this guy is a constant 
So what it means is when I take the derivative, velocity x of mass m1 is zero, velocity y of m1 is zero. Since a1 is a constant, derivative of constant is zero. So I have all these three velocities at zero. And now let's try to look at this little bit intuitively. So this link does not have any translation in x direction, y direction, or z direction. That's why you, we don't have any velocity in x direction, y direction, and z direction. Once again, this mass m1 does not translate about x0, y0, or z0. It stays where it is all the time. That's why the velocities are zero, which means for link one, the kinetic energy of translation is zero. And why is it zero? Because the velocities are zero. Now, what I want to do is I want to go a step further. Let's again, we will continue our analysis on link one. We are still on link one. I want to find out the kinetic energy of rotation, kinetic energy of rotation. Kinetic energy of rotation for link one is given as one half I xx omega x square plus one half I y y omega y square plus one half I z z omega z square. Now the question is, where do we get omega x, omega y, and omega z? If you recollect, we have derived the equation for Jacobian. So remember, we derived Jacobian equation. And the Jacobian equation was written as omega x, omega y, omega z. I'm gonna duplicate that relationship here. Zero R zero. Zero, zero, theta one dot plus zero R one zero zero theta two dot and we derived this notes lecture twelve. Now this is the overall Jacobian. Now what I want to what I mean by overall Jacobian is this is for link one and the whole thing is for link two. We did that for the end effector. Since end effector is part of link two, this whole expression is for link two. So now what I want you to do is for a minute, I want you to look at part of the Jacobian equation. And I'm gonna show you which part of the Jacobian equation I want you to look at. Since we are looking at link one, since we are looking at link one, I want you to just focus on the expression for the link one. So since we are looking for link one, I will write this expression omega x, omega y, omega z for link one is equal to zero r zero, 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 theta one dot. And zero R zero is nothing but an identity matrix one zero 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 one zero 
zero zero one multiplied by zero zero theta one dot, and when you perform this calculation, this will give you the answer to this is omega x for link one is equal to zero, omega y. For link one is equal to zero, and omega z for link one is equal to theta one dot. Now let's see if it kind of uh, makes sense. So what we are trying to see here is if you look at the rotation, the rotation of this link. Is about this axis. So this is theta one dot. Let me use a different color. So theta one dot. Uh, this is theta one dot. So this link is going to rotate about z not axis. The link does not have any rotation about x naught. This link does not have rotation about y naught. So, since there is no rotation about x naught, there is no rotation about y naught. It will not have angular velocity about x naught, angular velocity about y naught. It will only have angular velocity about z naught. So. This is zero plus this guy is zero. The only kinetic energy this link will have is omega i z z theta one dot square. This is the kinetic energy for link one. So with this information, I am able to find out the kind total kinetic energy. So kinetic energy total, and we are still on link one. For link one, the total kinetic energy for link one is from this previous expression that we found out over here. The linear kinetic energy is zero. And the rotational kinetic energy is one half i z z theta one dot square. Are you with me so far? Now let's move on to the kinetic energy for link two. So we have to find out same approach. We have to find out kinetic energy. Energy for link two. Now, what I want you to do is, how would we get the information for kinetic energy for link two? We will adopt the same approach. Somehow, from matrix zero H two, I want you to look at the matrix that you have zero H two, zero H two matrix. Will have a rotational matrix. This is zero R two. It will have zero zero zero. It will have one. And I'm gonna write this expression here, and then I'm gonna discuss this in just a second. The expression that you are looking at is a cosine theta two cosine theta one. A two cosine theta two sine theta one and A one plus A two sine theta two. Note these expressions are for the end effector. This is the position position. So end effector position. 
no in today you won't need the information from this lesson because for the homework the mass is not distributed mass is fixed at one end so you don't need the information from this lesson so now here is the tricky part this is the the position of the end effector and i need to write this down so if i ask you where is end effector located so the question is where is end effector with respect to frame 0 with respect to origin you will tell me the coordinates of the end effector the coordinates of end effector are i'm going to call this px py and pz so coordinates of the end effector are px py and pz but the question i want to ask here is where is mass m2 with respect to origin clearly mass m2 is not located where the end effector is mass m2 is over here mass m2 is over here and just for the sake of discussion this distance is a2 this distance is a2 so if you think about it if a2 is the total length the mass is actually located at distance a2 by 2 so the mass is at half link length so it's at half link length which means it is at distance a2 by 2 or in our case which is l2 by 2 so with the information that i have over here i can simply say the coordinates of mass m2 or the position or the position of mass m2 px this is for mass m2 this is not end effector it is a distance l2 by 2 cosine theta 2 cosine theta 1 py m2 is at distance l by 2 l2 by 2 cosine theta 2 sin theta 1 pz m2 now this is where the trick tricky part is so mass m2 is at the distance the z distance is a1 plus a2 cosine of theta so the distance that's going to be is equal to a1 plus l2 by 2 sin theta 2 so please note a1 here and a1 here will remain same because you are when you look at the z cons component you are going to have for a1 plus l by 2 sin theta 2 okay so the good news is we found out the positions of mass m2 but we actually need velocity of mass m2 in x direction we need velocity of mass m2 in y direction and we need velocity of mass m2 in z direction so i need these velocities how do i get these velocities and these velocities can be obtained from the jacobian expressions that we derive and what i'm going to do is i'm going to write down those expressions and you have these expressions uh, written i actually manually derived these expressions so i will write these expressions down l2 by 2 Minus sine theta two, theta two dot cosine theta one minus l two by two 
sine theta one, theta one dot cosine theta two, L two by two minus sine theta two, theta two dot sine theta one plus A two cosine theta one, theta one dot cosine theta two. And here you will have zero plus L two by two cosine theta two theta two dot. So these are the velocities. These are the velocities of mass m two. Now, with this information, I am able to find out the kinetic energy of uh, mass m two in translation. So, kinetic energy of mass m two in translation is equal to, and I am gonna, I am not gonna write, rewrite those expressions, m. Two v x two square. This is the velocity of velocity x of m two plus one half m two v y two square, which is velocity y of mass m two plus one half. M two v z two square, which is the velocity in z direction of mass m two. What was v z two? V z two is this in p y. Okay, let me see p y sine yeah p y sine theta one. Cosine theta two, sine theta one, cosine theta one. Yeah, yeah, sine theta one. So, we see two. Now, story does not end there. We need to still find out the kinetic energy in rotation. Kinetic energy in rotation comes from The equation of Jacobian, and for this, what you will do is you will use the entire Jacobian expression. In other words, you will have omega x, omega y, omega z, which is equal to zero r zero, zero zero theta one dot plus zero r one. Zero zero theta two dot. You will use this entire expression. That will be omega of mass or omega of link link two. And that expression we already derived. And I will give you omega x is equal to sine theta one. Theta two dot omega y is minus cosine theta one theta two dot and omega z is theta one dot. This is for link two. So the kinetic energy in rotation, kinetic energy in rotation. For link two is one half i x x omega x. I'm going to call this omega x two, omega y two, omega z two. Omega x two square. So this guy plus one half i y y omega y two square. Is this guy 
plus one half i z z omega z two square, which is nothing but this guy. Now we the total kinetic energy. So the total kinetic energy is nothing but for kinetic energy translation for mass two plus kinetic energy of rotation for link two and that gives you the total kinetic energy so total kinetic energy total so total kinetic energy is kinetic energy for one plus kinetic energy for two so you are going to get a very long expression for total kinetic energy but we will typically try to use matlab to solve this problem next part is easy now we want to find out the potential energy and i will i'll need 2 minutes to discuss potential energy so the there will be potential energy for mass m1 and mass m2 now how would you get the potential energies from mass m1 and m2 please note you already have the locations of masses so i'm going to go back and you have and please note you have pz of mass m1 so the potential energy for mass m1 is nothing but m g p z for m1 plus m g p z for m2 now you will see where would p z for m1 will come from p z from m1 will come from here so this is pz for m1 this is pz for m1 and where would pz for uh m2 will come from pz for m2 will come from here this is the pz for m2 so you already have the expressions for pz for m1 and pz for m2 and once you have this you can formulate your lagrangian kinetic energy minus potential energy and send that to matlab and matlab will give you the solution all right with this and we yeah, i'm going to stop here